I'm Scott Allen Miller, and welcome to my camera cafe. Today I want to talk a little bit about vintage cameras, and specifically that we are entering the era of digital vintage, or vintage digital. Now when I grew up using cameras, my experiences started in the early 1980s, and that was the film era. We didn't have digital cameras yet. There was not available anywhere on the market. The idea that they were coming was still very much hypothetical, and very few people had a good idea what that would even look like. So we were deep into the film era. But the 1980s were interesting because their world of film was one that was extremely mature. Our cameras themselves had not made major changes since, say, the 1950s or the 1960s. The lenses had the same technology going back even farther, the 1930s or 1940s. Film itself was the component of the system that was advancing most dramatically during that era with new developments coming out throughout the, the 80s and the 90s, such as uh, Kodak Ektachrome Elite, faster speeds, T-Max, Fuji, Velvia, and things like that made for an upgraded experience, but cameras themselves changed very little. Towards the end of that era, we started to have a prevalence of things like uh, auto exposure and later auto focus. These things would make using film cameras dramatically easier towards the end of that era. And they did exist previously, but they were highly, uh, they're very expensive and, and highly unavailable to average uh, camera users. So this is the era where the quality of the image didn't really change very much. Even going back to the 1960s, normal people were able to afford cameras with amazing optics and the camera bodies themselves worked very, very well. And we were using 35 millimeter film predominantly throughout that entire era. We had medium format, we had large format, and please excuse the loud parrot in the background. And uh, so it was an interesting era that we could go back and use cameras that were quite old and get amazing results as long as we were using current film. You didn't need to have a new camera. New cameras were there for convenience. They were there for uh, features that were very limited in their scope. For example, uh, burst images would be used for sports, for example, or maybe portraiture portraiture photography. We would uh, add autofocus to make it easier. Auto exposure allowed a lot of people to use cameras uh, and take very good photos that were unable to handle the math or did not want to handle the math of doing exposure uh, previous to that. Uh, before uh, about the late 1970s, many times you had to use an exposure meter or have complex guides to even figure out how much light you were dealing with so that you could do your math from there. Choosing your ISO, your shutter speed, your aperture were very difficult things given that you had no way to review anything that you did, possibly for weeks, and then you had to manually record all of your settings. It was a complicated process. By the early 1980s, the camera that I was using, an early Canon SLR, had uh, TTL or through the lens metering, which was fantastic. As you looked through the camera, there was a simple light meter that told you how bright the scene was that you were looking at on average, or it may have been center weighted. And then you simply had a couple things that you could do. You could set the ISO, but the ISO of course was determined by the film. So you were simply telling the camera what ISO film you had put into it. You weren't able to adjust it. So given that information, though, that locked one corner of your exposure triangle. And then you could move the shutter speed and the aperture, and it would move a little indicator inside the camera up and down. And if you lined it up with the amount of light that was there, chances are you would get a moderately well uh, uh, exposed image. But it was difficult, and the amount of latitude you had to modify the image after the fact was relatively low. That made for a really exciting era. We were able to go back and get low-cost, older cameras, play with lots of different types of cameras, and as long as we were using new film, we could get amazing results. You could do professional work on just about anything. It was really interesting and fun being in that era. When we moved to digital, that went away, unless you stuck with film, of course. Today, you could still go get a 1960s camera, put a good lens on it, make sure it doesn't have mold or mildew, and you're pretty much good to go. If, as long as you're using film, you can make some amazing images. With digital, when we made the transition, sure, they had the optics down, but the sensors, which replaced film, led to us having a lot of problems with the image quality being massively less than that of film and often not that usable. This went on for many years at the beginning, but of course we had to work through the kinks of the system before we got to things that were really good. Eventually digital more or less met 
or beat the standards of film, the flexibility took over and we were able to move into a fully digital era. And that happened quite some time ago. Now it seems like a foregone conclusion that film was going to, film was going to go away and that digital was going to take over. But at the time, it was a long time that we didn't know how long it was going to take. Sure, we knew someday. But we didn't know if it was going to be soon, and we didn't know how long film would hang on and how important it would be. But it ended up going away much faster, I think, than many of us thought. Simply, the cost accelerated of needing to process film, send it off somewhere, wait for it. The benefits to digital just outweighed uh, film so dramatically that people gave up relatively quickly. This has now led to a maturing of the digital market, to a point that I think it is extremely exciting. Again, something I've been missing being in digital for the last nearly 20 years is that ability to go to older cameras, older lenses, play with older things that we did uh, when I started in photography. My second camera that I used heavily was an Olympus rangefinder from the 1960s. I loved that camera. It had a great fixed lens. It had a lot of latitude. Its, it's built-in uh, manual focus system was a b wonderful thing to use. Loved it. It was a great experience. It made me happy using cameras. I didn't use it for sports. When I went into photojournalism professionally, I moved to a Nikon SLR with autofocus and auto exposure, and it made my life really, really easy. I still didn't have a camera that automatically read the ISO of my film. I can't even imagine how flexible that would have been. But using, using a nearly automatic film camera was such a change compared to what I've had. I had had previous to that. It was, it was truly amazing. But now in the digital era, finally I feel that we're at a point where really broadly we're able to go back and look at old cameras, potentially really old cameras, and, and choose to use them intentionally because we find them enjoyable to use. We think that they provide a quality of image that was, is, is not currently available or would be very expensive in another camera or just provides a, an overall experience or a price point, right? We want to experiment with something uh, or use a camera in a situation that may be a little bit dangerous and we don't want to take a more expensive newer camera out, but we'd be more than happy to do so with an older camera. Well, I think we've reached this era and I think it's really exciting. And we can think of it as the vintage digital era, or we can think of it as the used is accessible era. Suddenly sites like MPB and KEH, both of which I've used and neither of which sponsors me in any way, uh, are available along with countless other places, eBay and so forth, where you can go buy and sell used camera equipment and cameras and lenses and everything. And you can get really high quality stuff at reasonable prices and Rapidly, we're seeing this become a thing that people are doing all the time. And of course, in the 1980s, if that would have been available to us in the 1970s, 1960s, people would have done that. People would have sold cameras as they moved up. They would have bought cameras to test things out, whatever, because they were so good for so long. Now, finally, we're finding that cameras that are quite old, more than a decade old, can sometimes give us results that are so good we could use them even professionally, let alone as simply fun and entertaining cameras. We also got a boost for this. This is important that we have this era of social media where places like Instagram, for example, are often the primary place that people are uh, acquiring our images to look at them and that on phones is often the primary platform on which they are looking at them. Previous to this, we were often looking at images from places like Flickr, and we were looking at them on big screens or printing them out. And in that era where we were taking it a little bit more seriously, the majority of the time, having a high pixel count and the ability to print those images uh, at very high resolution was really important. But now, because we're often looking at a very small screen, we're often able to work at a much lower resolution and have it look absolutely fantastic. And this has made older cameras, those that may only have 12 megapixels or fewer, absolutely viable. And this is pointed out very easily by the fact that the iPhone 13, which is still an incredible pocketable ca uh, camera today, only has 12 megapixels at its maximum setting. Only 12. That's a number we had in traditional digital cameras more than a decade ago, a lot more than a decade ago, which brings me to my example piece that I'm holding. This is a Nikon D90. This is one of the early DX or APS-C sensor cameras from Nikon, fully digital SLR. And for me personally, this camera uh, is the oldest to me of the cameras that I still own and use. Uh, but this is a 12 megapixel digital SLR from about 20, 
uh, uh, 2008. I bought this camera when my eldest daughter was born. I had previously been using the Nikon D50, and I feel that the D50... Now, Robin Wong, who has a fantastic channel, does a great job, he has recently acquired his first Nikon D50, like in the last few weeks. And he's absolutely loving it, and he has a lot of reasons that he says he prefers the D50. The D50 is interesting because it has uh, the motor for older, style, much older, uh, pre-digital uh, Nikon lenses that required an actual motor to screw the the autofocus forward and back. And the D50 was the only digital camera that they offered with that motor. So he has that, and he really likes it. That was my first digital camera. My father has that camera now. It has not disappeared. But uh, I found it very bulky, and its 6 megapixel sensor and early sensor technology left a lot to be desired. As I started putting things online on my computer, I very quickly was like, oh, I really, I could, you can't really crop with it. You're really stuck uh, to get the resolution that's quite usable. Um, you don't have much latitude. So when my daughter was born, and I, I should point out, the images that I got from the D50 were fantastic. They just had this limitation. Overall, I was very happy with it, and that's why I stayed with the Nikon system. I had been a Nikon professional previously in the film era, but moving to sensor and processors, uh, there is a, a big opportunity for change. The companies who were good or that you liked in one era are not necessarily going to be anything alike in the later era because... Uh, the, the sensors of the, the film era were Kodak and Fujifilm. They were not Nikon and Canon. Today, it is Nikon and Canon who provide the sensors and the processing, and so all of your color, science, all of those types of things, those really important uh, aspects of your image, are being provided by the companies who previously provided the shutter and the mount. So it's very different in that aspect. So it's not a necessarily a given that I would stick with Nikon, but the D50 experience was so fantastic that I moved up to the D90, which moved me from 6 megapixels to 12. And for me, this camera is essentially future-proof. It is still the same image quality as that iPhone 13, which is my current phone. Sure, the 14 is now out, and it has a higher resolution, kind of, uh, but even that's sort of a gray area. We know that it'll be higher resolution quite soon uh, with the 15 and the 16, but the point being, this is still at a point where it's a high enough uh, megapixels that you can use it professionally. Maybe you're not going to make giant posters for Times Square, but you can do almost anything, and it is way more than you need for social media. You can use a camera like this that's 15 years old, and you can still crop and use professionally. So that's an interesting thing that if you are looking at getting into photography, and maybe if you're not doing active, uh, you know, professional sports where you want to get into many different types of things, a camera like this, which is available for under $100, may do a perfectly good job for you and give you a chance to become a professional, move into it, and then make decisions about a more expensive camera later. Or if you're a professional or just a hobbyist who really enjoys working with different cameras, you can go and get an older camera like this for next to nothing and explore a different camera family, a different family of lenses, maybe just a different camera body or whatever. And this is going to lead me to an upcoming topic that we're going to have in the near future. <laughs> the light has completely changed. Our, our color balance on this is going to be is going to be brutal. But the uh, I have a new camera, not this one. This is this is my antique that I have from the antique era, but I recently went back and got another camera from the same era as this one that I'm really excited to share with you guys in an upcoming episode, so be looking forward to that. Uh, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun playing with it, but I'm trying to make a lot of comparison images, so I have those ready for you when we do that episode. But for the first time, for me personally, and I think for a lot of people, and I see this in, I watch a lot of YouTube channels um, about cameras, in case that wasn't incredibly obvious, and in doing so, I, I notice that there's a great number of people on the shows that I like to watch who are going back and getting older cameras, whether it's just a two- or three-year-old camera uh, or a 20-year-old camera, and suddenly doing really fun things with them. Robin Wong being a great example. He went back to a camera that's nearly 20 years old and is loving the experience of using it. Um, of course, when you get to a certain age, you run into, like, they may not use modern SD cards, they may not have batteries that are available. So be aware, there are, there are potentially challenges. But you get to a certain point, like the D90, and there's no technology in this that you can't keep using today. So you're not limited yet by how old it is. It may need a new battery, but those batteries are available. It may need a new SD card. Those SD cards are available. That kind of stuff. So it's exciting to be in the era where finally we can go back and say there are these great cameras that maybe 
I didn't know about at the time. Maybe I wasn't into photography yet at the time. Maybe uh, it just wasn't the camera family or model that I had chosen, but now they're very affordable and I can go back and experiment with those cameras and maybe I can get results that I was, I'm not able to get with other cameras that I have, or perhaps I just want to be inspired. And that's a really big deal in photography. People downplay that all the time or, or simply miss it. But it's one of the most important things in choosing cameras is being able to go back and say, this camera, this makes me want to pick up my camera and go take pictures. It's one of the reasons that I keep DSLRs. Now, I don't use this one on a regular basis. This one is mostly collecting dust. It is 14 years old for me, 15 year old model. My daughter uses it sometimes, I but I was using this up until two years ago. At that point, those who watch my channel know that I replaced it in its lineup, in the place in my personal ecosystem with the, the later Nikon D3500, which is a 24 megapixel, but still SLR, but it's much smaller and lighter, has quite a few new features, a bit easier to use, and does turn out nicer images, but only barely, but it turns them out much more faster and more conveniently. The D3500 for me is something I still use all the time. I had it out last night doing photography. I had it out a few days before that doing event photography, stuff that I like to do. And it's a really important workhorse for me. I love having an SLR, even though I do video work professionally as well. I like having the DSLR experience from Nikon for me. I've been on Nikon for so long. It makes me really happy to go out and do these events and use that equipment and feel the SLR in my hand and feel the mirror move. And I just like the tactile experience. It inspires me and makes me go do things that I otherwise probably wouldn't do or I wouldn't do as much. And so that's important. And people downplay that or miss it. And it's, it's, I think it's incredibly important, probably more important than the image quality. Because let's face it, over the last 15 years, there have been very few cameras that aren't going to turn out results so good that you can use them. Some are certainly better than others. Some really stand out. Some have amazing colors. But you can also go into, you know, Lightroom and make adjustments that will make up for many of the shortcomings in some cameras. And that also leads to older cameras like this one. I can choose to shoot in RAW on this. And with the updated Nikon software, I can get newer JPEGs. I can get newer adjustments. I can do a little bit more, just a little bit, with those RAW files and turn them into more modern JPEGs than I could in camera from this. Also, some of these older cameras, not this one, have significantly updated firmware. So you may be getting some of those features, probably slower, probably later, but some of those old cameras are being updated quite a bit. And a great example is the one I'm actually recording on, which is the Olympus EM-1 Mark II. That camera had so many firmware upgrades that it essentially became a Mark III with slightly downgraded image stabilization, which doesn't make any difference when you're on a tripod like I am. So I am getting the equivalent of the last generation of Olympus video cameras and the very current one a lot of people say isn't actually that much better for normal video. It does have some really big additional features, but they really focus more on photography. And, and this one was so good that a lot of people feel that it's basically a draw. So this two generation and many year old and used Olympus video camera does such an amazing job. And many of you have written in and said, wow, the image quality on this is so fantastic. I hope this episode comes out that way as well. Uh, that wh what are you doing? What, what is this? And this is the Olympus color science. I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm not going back and color grading. I'm only white balancing. And I'm, I'm only using uh, the Olympus M Zuiko 25 millimeter lens, the, the premium F 1.8, nothing fancy. See, nothing expensive, all of it used, all of it many years old, and the results are absolutely fantastic. And I love using this camera. I love that I'm, I was able to do so on a, an extreme budget. I love that I was able to do so with a camera family I've been using for a very long time, since about 1992, 1991, um, and, and have always loved Olympus. And I, I love that I get to stick with them and with Nikon, the two I've used. Olympus was always my creative side and Nikon was always my professional side. Uh, and now I still use both and I am still very happy with both. That inspires me. That makes me want to make these videos for you guys. And I apologize for the break that we took. I've been very, very busy. I do have other YouTube channels that keep me extremely busy, but this one kind of without my knowledge started taking off. So most of you who have subscribed and most of the views of my videos have happened since my last video. And I was blissfully unaware that this was, this was taking off as it is. So I'm really excited to be here with you guys uh, making another video and I have many queued up to make. We will be making these much more regularly now that we know uh, this is something that people are really interested in. 
I am certainly very interested in this channel. I'm very excited that at the potential of this becoming a very real channel. Uh, it was it was really kind of meant to be just an outlet for me to be able to talk cameras because I don't really have anyone here. I live in Central America and I just have to say it is so hot and humid today. I am in the sun. It is about 95 degrees and very humid uh, and it is it's kind of unbearable trying to do this video but I didn't have time to do it this morning uh, so I apologize for, for how hot it is here but I live in the tropics. I live in Central America so getting camera equipment is a big challenge. Finding people who do photography is a big challenge. People certainly appreciate it and are into it and are like, wow, that's cool. They've never seen these cameras. They don't, they don't follow cameras uh, and there isn't a lot of equipment. There's no repair shops. I recently, I'm going to talk about this, one of my older, older lenses uh, from the D50, I believe uh, the, the famous 35 millimeter F1.4 has uh, has fungus on it and I have to figure out what to do. There's no repair shops here. There's no one who knows how to do anything. So I have to figure that out on my own. Luckily, it's not terrible. Uh, so far, the lens is working really well, but it has to be addressed. And here, fungus is a major problem because of the high humidity and the warm temperatures. I'm, I'm working on ways to have to store my camera. So I'll have an episode where we talk about storing cameras in the tropics in the future as I figure that out more and talk about the, the potential risks. Because I also have to worry about coming from air conditioning to the outside. Everything fogs up instantly, which is terrible for fungus. That, that creates an environment for fungus in the future. So things you have to worry about, especially when you're working with vintage cameras. I'm very excited that my older cameras are still usable and things that I can fall in love with and stay in love with. And I'm able to go out and find new cameras uh, to me for very low cost and get images that I may not have been able to get before and do things I was not able to do before and enjoy and inspire myself and just have fun providing images that people find valuable, whether just to look at on social media or to use in some type of fashion. It's uh, It's been fun doing this over the past year, kind of exploring this new vintage camera world, uh, new to me, and uh, I hope to share more of it with you in the upcoming episodes as we start looking at a very specific camera that I got for. I spent a long time researching exactly what I wanted, had a very specific goal, met it, and I'm very happy with it, and I'm gonna talk a bit about exactly why all the things behind this particular camera, why I love it so much, and how much fun I'm having with it. So we're going to be getting to that very soon. I'd like to say thank you. I am getting this. This happened all since my last video, so I haven't been here to say thank you. Uh, that people have been going on buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller and sponsoring the show. It's just getting started, right? We're still a very tiny channel. This is, I'm, I'm so blown away by how many people have uh, joined the, the community since I last uploaded. So thank you so much that for those of you who have sponsored and for those who enjoy this content, I would love it if you bought me a coffee to help support the show. And uh, whether you do or not, hit that like button, look down below, leave your comments. Let me know about vintage cameras that you're thinking about getting, ones that uh, you have gotten that you love, old cameras that you have laying around that you realize, wait, I could take that out and it would work great. Actually, I have to say this particular one that I'm holding, the power button, almost doesn't turn on anymore. The lens is still perfect, but the actual camera body lived on the ocean for a little while, not on the ocean, but right on the beach. And it had been heavily used prior to that. And after being on the beach for about a year and a half, uh, some of the switches and stuff are, are just about to die. It's not weatherproof like some other cameras. So yeah, this particular one is more of a museum piece than a work uh, working camera for me. It will work, it will take pictures, but it's on its last legs, so I'm sad about that. But that's okay. I have some really cool new stuff. We're going to talk about that. Thank you so much for joining me. Like, subscribe. I will see you next time.